Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell if you enjoy this episode. Alice Rankin asked a co-worker if he could give her a ride to work the next morning. Her car would be in the shop. When he arrived, he found Alice in her bed, the victim of a brutal and grisly murder. She had been decapitated and her head was missing. Two weeks later to the day, Mary Calcutta was supposed to have a friend over for a visit. When he arrived, Mary had also been viciously murdered. In a bizarre twist, both women lived in the Orchard Apartment Complex in Houston. The day after Mary was found, the body of Doris Threadgill was discovered. She had been murdered in a similar fashion in her townhouse, just eight miles to the north of the Orchard Apartments. The city was gripped in fear while police tried to track down the elusive killer. Fifty-four days would pass, and then two deaths came on the same night. Joanne Huffman was shot and left in a city park while her boyfriend, Robert Spangenberger, was found locked in the trunk of his car. Like Alice Rankin, he had been decapitated and his head was also missing. Both bodies were found within four miles of Threadgill's apartment, less than 14 miles from the Orchard Apartments. Houston police struggled to identify the killer and prevent future attacks, but the city was in the midst of a crime wave, stretching resources thin. The question that haunted the residents had no answer. Would the killer be found before he struck again? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 115, The Houston Decapitator. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine a truly horrible series of crimes that haunted the city of Houston in the late 1970s. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow Trace Evidence on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. The show is also on MeWe and Minds. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merchandise, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donating options, and contact information to submit case suggestions, or you can email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. In the summer of 1979, a brutal murderer emerged in Houston, Texas, committing five grisly murders, though to this day, many wonder if it was the work of one killer or multiple killers. This is episode 115, The Houston Decapitator. The city of Houston has an eclectic style, perhaps due in part to it being the largest American city without zoning laws or what locals humorously refer to as the Z-word. While there are codes which govern development, there's a unique blend of commercial and residential spaces. This gives Houston a unique look, one described by the Houston Chronicle as a giant monopoly board, often seeing houses, concrete plants, and hotels dotting along the same streets, sometimes in close proximity. Houston has a lot of intriguing architecture, from the Chapel of St. Basil to the Audrey Jones Beck Building. Truly, Houston stands out for its undeniably creative, if not patchwork, appearance of buildings carrying fascinating histories. However, there are simplistic structures, modern buildings perhaps lacking the flair of others, but harboring their own curious and sometimes horrific stories. One such structure sits in southwest Houston at 5909 Glenmont Drive, just to the west of Renwick Drive. Today, it's the home of La Plaza Apartments, a three-level building painted in a sunset mix of orange and yellow, 
with teal stripes and black faux wrought iron ornamental railings offering affordable living and mid-sized units. While a bright and eye-catching building today, in the late 1970s it was the starting point for some of Houston's most notorious and horrifying murders. Then, the space was home to 552 units known as Orchard Apartments, and while the new structure is modernized, a glowing veneer set over the old bones, for many longtime Houston residents, it is forever linked with the horrors that took place within its walls. At the time, the Houston police referred to the crimes as inhuman and disturbing, with one detective telling the Fort Worth Star-Telegram one of the murders was, quote, the worst knife assault anyone has ever seen around here, end quote. What was hoped to have been an aberration, a single murder committed by a true psychopath, quickly became a terrifying series which gripped the city in fear and sent police hunting for a deranged killer. Soon, though, similar crimes began occurring, leaving police to speculate as to whether or not it was the work of a lone individual, a group of killers, or perhaps multiple killers working independently from one another. Alice Elaine McDonald Rankin was born on July 7, 1946 in Dallas to parents Marvin and Alice. Alice had a younger brother, Carson, who came along when she was 13 years old. There isn't a lot of background information out there about Alice, though multiple newspaper articles include quotes from friends and co-workers who describe her as sweet and kind, a woman who loved to laugh. Alice married John Rankin in November of 1965 in Kaufman County. The couple had one child, a daughter, but Alice and John separated in April of 1978, just over a year before her murder. In July of 1979, Alice was working as a secretary for Beauvais Engineers, which offers engineering and construction services related to HVAC, fire protection, security systems, and project management. The week of July 22nd, Alice had some issues with her car and arranged for it to be serviced towards the end of the week. Sometime early in the week, Alice made arrangements with her co-worker, 40-year-old Bob Smith, to give her a ride on the morning of Friday, July 27th. At the time, there wasn't anything strange about the arrangement and Smith was happy to help out. However, when he arrived at Alice's apartment that morning, he would experience a grisly scene which would remain with him for the rest of his life. Smith arrived at the Orchard Apartments, apartment number 409, at approximately 7.30 a.m. Upon arrival, he sat in his car for a few minutes, but when Alice didn't come out, he walked up to her door, which he found partially open. He later told the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, quote, I thought she was getting her purse. The door was slightly ajar, end quote. At first, when Smith entered the apartment, he didn't see anything out of the ordinary. He called out to Alice but received no response. After a short time, Smith began to get an eerie feeling, later telling reporters, quote, I got that feeling something was wrong, a too quiet kind of feeling, end quote. This is when Smith noticed the blood. There was a trail of blood droplets leading from the door, weaving its way through the apartment and continuing under the bedroom door. Pushing the door open, Smith saw an absolutely gruesome scene. Alice lay nude on the bed, her ankles and one wrist bound with electrical wiring. Alice's upper body was concealed by bedding and a pillow. Rushing in to check if Alice was alive, Smith removed the bedding and pillow to check her breathing. Beneath the blood-soaked cloth, Smith found Alice's mutilated remains. There were stab wounds, an extreme amount of blood, and horrifyingly, she had been decapitated. Panicked and sickened, Smith ran to a neighboring apartment to call 911. Houston police arrived on the scene within minutes and were taken aback by what they were seeing. Many detectives, hardened by crimes they'd investigated in the past, were shocked with what has been referred to as one of the most brutal crime scenes of the time. While some worked to secure the body, photograph the scene, and examine it for fingerprints, others went through the apartment desperately searching for any clues which might suggest who had been responsible, how he had gotten into the apartment, and whether or not this had been random or had some link to Alice herself. Near Alice's body, investigators found two clues as to the cause and manner of death. 
There was a double-edged razor blade lying not far from the body. There was also a butcher knife soaked in blood. It was determined that the knife had been used to remove Alice's head, which was taken off from just above her shoulder in a jagged, poorly executed job. Perhaps more disturbingly was the fact that the knife used was not brought by the killer, but instead had been taken from Alice's own kitchen. There was an empty space in the butcher block. The rest of the knives were present in their slots. It has since been speculated whether the razor was involved in the initial attempt to decapitate the victim or if perhaps it was used to cause some of the other wounds she had sustained. While investigating the scene, detectives discovered a pool of blood on the floor which appeared to be the origin of the blood trail Smith had followed. It was later determined that the pool of blood had been developed after the killer had placed Alice's head there on the floor for several minutes. It was never determined what the killer was up to during that time. Following the trail themselves, it led from the bedroom out into the apartment, working backward from the way Smith had followed it. The blood continued outside of the apartment, which was on the ground level. It ended at an empty parking space, leading investigators to believe that the killer had taken the head with him. An extensive search of the apartment, complex, and surrounding area yielded no results, and to this day, it's unknown what the killer did with Alice's head as it has never been recovered. At the time, authorities made note of the gruesome similarities between Alice's murder and those of Edmund Kemper, dubbed the co-ed killer, who had decapitated his victims keeping their heads and disposing of the bodies between 1972 and 73. Kemper turned himself in and was imprisoned in November of 73. Police ultimately surmised that the killer had walked from Alice's apartment into the parking lot, likely carrying her head openly, not concealing it in a bag or other container. Alice's body was removed from the scene and brought downtown where an autopsy would be conducted, hopefully revealing more clues about the murder itself. Surprisingly, the medical examiner determined that Alice's cause of death had not been stabbing, nor the decapitation but rather asphyxiation. Perhaps this was one bright spot of the murder, suggesting that Alice had been deceased at the time she was decapitated, rather than having been killed in such a monstrous manner, though it offered little comfort for investigators or Alice's family. The autopsy also revealed that Alice had been sexually assaulted prior to her murder. There has been no mention of defensive wounds, which seems to suggest that the killer caught Alice by surprise. The horror of the crime galvanized the citizens of Houston and sent shockwaves throughout the city. Women living alone in apartments were scared to go home at night. Detective D.M. Fultz told the press that, while they were hoping to bring in the killer sooner than later, they had over three million suspects in the city with no indication of where to begin. He went on to say, quote, There should be more leads coming in because it's getting a lot of publicity. We're hoping for an early arrest. End quote. When asked about how the killer gained entry to Alice's apartment, police could only speculate, saying there was no sign of forced entry. Fultz explained, quote, He could just go up and act like a maintenance man or paper boy or anything. End quote. Robin Stevenson, 25 at the time, was the manager for Orchard Apartments. During an interview with the Star-Telegram, she explained that in the days after the murder, she had received multiple calls from tenants who gave notice that they were planning on moving out. While all 552 door locks were changed following the murder, Stevenson couldn't blame the residents for their desire to get away, telling the paper, quote, If I was a single woman, I'd get the hell out or find a roommate fast. End quote. Those were exactly the thoughts of 26-year-old Mary Michael Calcutta. Mary lived in the Orchard Apartments, two floors above where Alice had been murdered, and for several days after, she spent her nights sleeping over at the homes of her friends. According to those who knew Mary, she was terrified to return home. Mary was born on September 8, 1952 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to parents Joseph and Margaret. One of six children, Mary had one sister, Margaret, and four brothers, Joseph, James, Gerard, and Fran. Mary was named after her maternal grandparents, Mary and Michael Dugan. 
According to the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Mary had grown restless in Pennsylvania, and after a trip to Houston, she fell in love with the city. It wasn't new to the Calcutta family, as multiple children had left the area. Mary's older sister had left to become a nun years earlier. Aside from the appeal of the city itself, Mary hoped to find work in the booming economy. After settling, Mary joined a Christian group and made friends. She called home once a week and sent cards for holidays and special events. According to an article written by Robert Griminick, who you may know as the voice of the popular YouTube channel Criminally Listed, when Mary did finally return to her apartment, she told friends that she would be pushing a bookcase in front of her door at night and would not let anyone in if she didn't already know them. Sadly, whatever precautions Mary may have taken did not serve to keep her safe as exactly two weeks to the day that Alice was murdered, Mary herself would fall victim to the same killer, just two floors up from where he had struck the first time. Unlike Alice's case, however, Mary may not have been caught by surprise, as evidence indicates that she fought her killer, and she fought him furiously. On Friday, August 10th, a friend who had made plans to visit Mary came by her apartment, number 484, at approximately 4.30 p.m. Reportedly, after receiving no answer, the friend entered the apartment, which was unlocked. There, in the bathroom, the friend found Mary's body, fully dressed in her bathtub. She was covered in blood, and it was clear that there had been a struggle between Mary and her killer. Houston police were notified, and for the second time in two weeks, arrived at the Orchard Apartments, finding a brutal and bloody scene. According to initial reports, Mary had been brutally attacked, sustained multiple stab wounds in the process. Once again, much like Alice's case, the weapon used was a butcher knife taken from the victim's own kitchen. Once again, the killer had left the blood-stained weapon behind. This time, though, the death was not due to asphyxiation, and instead, on her death certificate, it's stated as being the result of three stab wounds the multitude of others having been non-fatal. The murder itself, however, seemed to be much more violent, with Houston police detective Jim Binford telling the Houston Chronicle, quote, Mary Calcutta died harder than any murdered woman I ever worked. She fought her killer from the front door until she couldn't fight him anymore. He stabbed her with such force that it went all the way through her and it bent the blade, end quote. An autopsy was later performed, and it was determined that, in addition to having been stabbed, Mary had also been sexually assaulted. While an exact count of how many stab wounds has never been reported, several interviews with detectives revealed that it had been in the dozens. While there was a vast wealth of similarities between Mary's murder and Alice's, there were some differences beyond the cause of death. Mary was found fully clothed while Alice had been left nude. In addition to this, while Alice had been decapitated, Mary was not, though it was speculated at the time that this may have been due to the killer either getting scared off by something or perhaps not having the time he wanted. Mary's throat had been viciously slashed and there were stab wounds near the slash. It was unclear at the time whether this was the result of an attempted decapitation. As was the case with Alice, this second murder just two weeks later sent the city deeper into a state of fear. While more residents moved out of the complex, this being enough to convince those who had chosen to stay previously, gun sales also increased. Police reported that a large number of single women had purchased firearms in hopes of protecting themselves. At the time, the city of Houston was under siege in terms of murder. From January to August 79, there had been 382 homicides, compared to 265 from the same time frame the previous year. That represented a 44% rise in homicides. That same weekend, there were a total of 12 homicides. Now, though, with the murders of Alice Rankin and Mary Calcutta, authorities had a completely different kind of killer in the area. Police initially were unsure if this was the work of a single killer or multiple killers. Houston Police Lieutenant Chuck Laughlin spoke with the Tyler Morning Telegraph, saying, quote, We're just trying to determine at this time what is similar and what is dissimilar. At present time, 
I don't know whether we've got one suspect or two working in this vicinity, end quote. At the time of her death, Mary had been dating a man on and off. While his name has never been revealed, some articles have reported that police looked at him as a possible suspect for a period of time. He may, in fact, have been the friend who discovered Mary's body that day. Binford later told reporters, quote, We had a person of interest probably three days after the murders occurred, but you have to have evidence, end quote. Binford became personally invested in the case and would go on to spend many nights sitting on the roof of the orchard apartments wearing night vision goggles waiting for the killer to return, according to the Post-Gazette. In a subsequent interview taking place the same day as Lieutenant Laughlin's, Detective Binford stated that they hadn't yet found any link between Alice and Mary, at least in terms of their social circles or anything else which might tie them together and therefore explain the killer targeting each of them. It appeared as though the attacks were more random in nature, perhaps targeting the orchard apartments for one reason or another. Some speculated it just may have been a case where the killer thought, if it worked once, why not try it again? There was one thing authorities could agree on, though. If the same man had committed these crimes, it was unlikely these would be the last ones. When asked later about this, Detective Binford replied, quote, He just didn't stop doing it. End quote. While the murders of Alice and Mary may have been considered linked almost since the day they happened, there was another murder which took place the same day Mary had been killed. Doris Lynn Threadgill was born on January 13, 1952, to parents Robert and Fay Armstrong. A Texas native born in Corpus Christi, she traveled throughout her early life, moving from Corpus Christi to Austin and finally Lockhart. Doris was second born, having three sisters, Linda, Palma, and Pamela. Doris was smart, funny, and vibrant, according to friends and family. She had graduated high school in 1971, finishing near the top of her class. She attended college at Texas Christian University, Southwest Texas State, and later the University of Texas. She achieved her bachelor's degree from the University of Houston in business technology and later obtained a license as an audiometric technician. Doris was, by all accounts, difficult to keep in one place. She moved schools, jobs, and had an affinity for living to her fullest. She spent time as a model, worked for an environmental firm, and at the time of her death was apprenticing under her father to take over a beauty supply company that he had started. Beyond that, Doris was a writer, painter, and sculptor. Doris had been described as a beautiful soul who was always smiling and had an undeniable zest and charisma. Sadly, Doris's life would come to a brutal and violent end when she was just 27 years old. On Saturday, August 11th at approximately 9 a.m., an exterminator arrived at the Houston townhouse of Doris to do a routine spraying. The townhouse was located at 1508 Early Lane, approximately 6.5 miles to the north of the Orchard Apartments. Receiving no answer, the exterminator proceeded into the townhouse to perform his scheduled service, but instead was met with a grisly scene. Doris was dead, having been stabbed multiple times in the chest and having her throat so severely slashed that authorities described her as being nearly decapitated. Her death certificate goes on to describe seven stab wounds into her chest and one through her back, penetrating the chest with a, quote, massive cutting wound of neck, end quote. There was no sign of forced entry into the townhouse, much like the previous two murders. In Doris's home, police located a trail of blood leading outside, but it quickly stopped, once again leading investigators to believe that the killer had been parked in that vicinity. Considering that Doris had been last seen alive at 9 p.m. Thursday the 9th and was found at 9 a.m. Saturday the 11th, it was believed that she had been killed sometime during the 10th, possibly within hours of Mary. There were obviously striking similarities between Doris's murder and those of Alice and Mary. However, there were three distinct differences. Firstly, Doris had been killed several miles from the orchard apartments in a townhouse. Secondly, there has never been any report of Doris having been sexually assaulted. And thirdly, 
the murder weapon was not recovered at the scene. Now, some have speculated this crime was committed by the same killer, arguing that he could have chosen to change up his approach to throw off police, while others believe this brutal crime was committed by someone else, perhaps a copycat. Lieutenant Laughlin told the Tyler Morning Telegraph that, while there were similarities, Doris's murder was probably not connected to those of Alice and Mary. Later, in the Longview News, Laughlin explained that no links had been established between the three victims outside of them living in the same complex. He did, however, advise local women to ensure their doors and windows were locked and to deny strangers entry into their apartments even if they came under the guise of delivery men or other services. Better to call the police, even if it's an innocent event. Four days after Doris's murder, police announced that they were working to build a psychological profile of the killer or killers. Psychological profiling wasn't exactly new in 1979. It had been attempted as early as 1912. However, the FBI Behavioral Science Unit wasn't formed until 72, some seven years earlier, and wouldn't begin to truly break ground and achieve poignant insights until 78, when Robert Ressler and John Douglas developed their serial killer classifications. In 1980, the FBI invited local police to introduce them to the program, so in a sense, the Houston police were making their own attempts at breaking down the potential psychological profile on their own. Detective Binford told the Star-Telegram that they believe the killer was a male, introverted, and isolated. He would find it hard to work with others, though he was believed to be educated and to have above-average intelligence. Binford went on to explain that the man likely did not receive sexual gratification from the crimes, though this particular point has been highly debated considering the sexual assaults of Alice and Mary. However, Binford noted that the killer may have felt sorry for the crimes, or at least the victims, though not sorry enough to confess or tell anyone, implying that there was a shame associated with the murders. Binford later said the killer was likely used to being the smartest man in the room. According to Binford, over the years, he put thousands of hours into Mary's case. He frequently asked other detectives and psychologists to review the case, hoping to find something he had previously missed, perhaps some minute detail that could break everything open. Unfortunately, he was forced to address the harsh reality. There are some cases you can just never break, some evidence that will forever elude you, but it didn't make him any less determined. Mary's case file sat on his desk for more than two decades. Despite their profile, the six detective unit working the case 24 hours a day were unable to locate a potential suspect, or at least one they could actually connect it to. People were spoken to, known criminals were tracked down and interviewed, locals were canvassed for information, but police struggled to get a grip on the killer. As the cases began growing cold, some semblance of normalcy began creeping back in. While homicides remained on the rise in the city, the month of September passed without this killer striking again. While the crimes had been sensationalized and written about and reported extensively, things began to fade, and while the families continued reaching out to the Houston police for information, leads, anything, the public in general began to move on. It appeared the threat had passed. Some believed the killer had moved on. Others assumed that he had been arrested for an unrelated crime. Nearly two months would pass. But 54 days after the murder of Doris and Mary, a disturbingly similar crime took place, except this time there were two victims. By October 1st of 1979, Houston's homicide numbers had risen even higher, with the city's 500th murder taking place, the same number of murders which had happened in the entirety of 1978. Between October 1st and the 17th, there would be nine more two of which we will address now. 18-year-old Robert Spangenberger and his girlfriend, 16-year-old Joanne Huff, had made plans to get married. The two teens had been together for over a year, and according to everything I've read, they were basically inseparable. Unfortunately, there is very little information out there about Robert and Joanne, and there's not very much about the crime itself, but considering its proximity to the other crimes and the similar nature of at least one of the deaths, this homicide is often considered in conjunction with the other three. 
There are several reported sightings of Robert and Joanne on the night of October 3rd. Homicide detective Gil Schultz told the Marshall News Messenger that multiple witnesses saw the couple at a Pizza Hut restaurant along Long Point Road, a mile and a half to the northwest of Freed Park, at approximately 10 p.m. There did not appear to have been any incidents which took place at the restaurant itself, though Schultz also stated that at some point that night, Robert was involved in an altercation at a nearby park, presumably Freed Park. In some reports, the altercation is reported as a fight, though there are no further details publicly available, nor how the police became aware of the fight itself. This is the last reported sighting of Robert. Later on that night, residents living in an area near Freed Park, just under one mile to the east of Doris's apartment, called police to report that a young woman had run onto their porch, banging on the door and screaming. Multiple papers, including the Houston Chronicle, have reported that the young woman screamed out, quote, help, don't do this to me, end quote. The residents claim that a man wearing a hat grabbed the woman by her hair and dragged her off the porch. They also said that moments later, they heard gunshots. When park police officers arrived at the home, they looked over the porch and spoke to the residents. Reportedly, they told the residents that there was no sign of a struggle or blood on the porch and that they had likely been the victims of a teenage prank. The gunshots that they had heard, more than likely, had been firecrackers. Relieved, the residents went about their night and park police went back to their patrol. However, the very next morning, the complexion of this call would completely change. On Thursday, October 4th, a man riding his bike through Watonga Park, four miles to the northeast of Freed Park, came upon the body of a young woman lying near a park bench. I should note, while multiple papers reported this detail, at least one, the Victoria Advocate, said that the body was found near a picnic table. When police arrived at the scene, they found the victim, later identified as Joanne Huffman, had been shot through the mouth. Not many details about the scene have been publicly reported, however, the Longview News Journal stated that when Joanne was found, she was lying face down. Her shoes and underwear were missing. This seems to agree with a detail reported later about the fate of Robert Spangenberger. It should be noted that at the time, Houston police told reporters that there had been several muggings and sexual assaults in the park in the weeks leading up to the murder. Around the same time that detectives were examining the scene in Watonga Park, Police received a 911 call from a small car dealership located in the 4200 block of Magnum Road. This area is located between Freed and Watonga Parks, being three miles north of Freed and one mile to the southwest of Watonga. An employee working at the dealership called police after making a strange discovery. Among the cars for sale at the business was one which didn't belong, a white Dodge as reported by the Houston Chronicle. Reportedly, as the employee approached the vehicle to determine why it was there, he noted blood smears on the trunk and rear bumper, prompting him to call the police. When police arrived at the scene, they gained access to the trunk and were met with a gruesome sight. There was the headless body of a young man jammed into the blood-soaked trunk. Based on the amount of blood present, investigators determined that the victim had likely been decapitated while in the trunk. The victim was identified as Robert Spangenberger when his wallet was found. The wallet contained $12, which, for police, ruled out the possibility of a robbery gone wrong. Examination of the vehicle revealed that within the car was a woman's shoes and underwear. A purse present in the vehicle was determined to have belonged to Joanne Huffman. Once police determined that the two crimes were linked, they followed up on the report from the previous night of the woman on the porch and the gunshots. When they arrived at the home, much to their surprise despite the report from park police, they found the presence of blood. Police theorized that Joanne and Robert had been attacked in Freed Park, at which time Robert was likely shot. Joanne then fled the scene looking for help when the killer took her back to the park. Robert was loaded into the trunk, Joanne was forced into the vehicle and driven to Watonga Park, where she was subsequently shot and killed. Robert was then taken to a secluded area where he was decapitated. 
Robert's head has never been found, and authorities can't say why it was taken, as it obviously wasn't intended to prevent identification since his wallet, with his ID, was left in his pocket. When asked about possible links between the double murder and the murders of Doris, Mary, and Alice, police did not believe there were any solid connections. It was theorized that the killings of Joanne and Robert were likely unrelated, and it was possible that the decapitation was either done to throw investigators off, to make them believe it was the same man who had committed the other killings, or possibly had been done for a reason that they couldn't at that time, nor today, determine. October 4th was a violent day in Houston beyond the murders of Robert and Joanne. According to the Victoria Advocate, two robbery detectives, James Netters and James Birch, were shot after going to a home to question a suspect about a robbery. An unrelated suspect opened fire, non-fatally wounding the officers. 54-year-old carpenter Bill Hasbrock was shot and killed by the same man, who also hit Hasbrock's 16-year-old son Don in the leg and 7-year-old Cecil Butler in the mouth. Robert Keith Boyd, 31, was the man firing the shots. Police pursued and Boyd entered a storage shed behind a home nearby to where the shootings had taken place. Utilizing a 25 caliber pistol, Boyd took his own life. There would be several other homicides in Houston throughout the rest of the year. However, the deaths of Robert Spangenberger and Joanne Huffman were the last to involve a decapitation, and whoever committed the previous murders had either fled, died, or perhaps moved on to continue his spree elsewhere. When cold case investigator Sergeant Paul Motard was asked about links between the five cases, he told the Houston Chronicle, quote, I don't think it's the same suspect, but you've got to keep an open mind in these things. I'm not ruling anything out anything's possible, end quote. In February of 1984, five years after the murders, Henry Lee Lucas came into the picture. Now, I have to preface this by saying that Lucas is notorious for claiming credit for crimes he did not commit. However, while Lucas claimed to be leading police to the burial site of missing Tulane medical student Stephanie Lee Smith, he also told authorities that he, along with his frequent killing partner, Otis Toole, had murdered Joanne Huffman and Robert Spangenberger in Houston in 1979. Lucas alleged that the site of Smith's remains was nearby to the location of Robert's head, which he told investigators he would show them. According to Lucas, he and Toole had come upon Robert and Joanne outside of a convenience store the night they were killed. He alleged that while he took Joanne into the park and shot her, Toole took Robert and decapitated him. There's a major problem with this story, though. The remains of Stephanie Lee Smith nor the head of Robert Spangenberger have ever been found. While Lucas claimed he and Toole had been responsible, no evidence has ever been presented to confirm that. In the case of Stephanie Smith, she is listed as an alleged victim, though Namus still has her listed as missing. At least one newspaper, The Town Talk in Alexandria, Louisiana, incorrectly stated that both Smith and Robert's head were found. However, in addition to Smith still being missing, Robert's head is also listed as missing with the Houston Police Department. Sadly, this isn't all that surprising, as Lucas frequently took credit for crimes he didn't commit, and in other instances, crimes he may have committed but either forgot or purposefully misdirected investigators to the sites of their remains. However, there are those who continue to wonder if Lucas, Toole, or both could be involved with any of the Houston decapitations. The last piece of news regarding the five murders in Houston in 1979 comes in 2010. At the time, cold case investigators were hoping to land a break in the case due to the development of DNA technology, and so they sent out physical evidence from two of the cases to a private lab. Sadly, due to the age of the items and possibly the way they were stored, the lab was unable to extract any DNA from the items. There is no DNA from the killer on file. There are no more updates about the case, and newspaper archives and police statements regarding the five homicides essentially stopped in the early 1980s, but for a few mentions from cold case investigators over the years. Five families were shattered by the hands of a vicious and violent killer or killers. Five deaths inside of a two and a half month span, all within miles of one another. 
two decapitations, two sexual assaults, three stabbings, one shooting. The crimes work the gamut of MOs, weapons, and approaches. Some are believed to be connected, others are in consideration but can't be known for sure. For Houston police, it's a series of murders that haunts them to this day. The idea that a brutal killer or killers got away with these horrible crimes and remains free today, if still alive. For the families, it's even harder. Brothers and sisters lost, children stolen, and in such brutal fashion. The Calcutta family remains actively involved, offering rewards and speaking with cold case investigators. When speaking to the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Fran Calcutta, Mary's younger brother, Explain that at family gatherings, they can't help but wonder what all their lives might have been like had Mary lived, what she might have done, what she could have become. He acknowledged that he reads blogs, watches videos, anything that addresses the case. When asked why, he simply replied, quote, I like to see it kept alive. Who knows? Maybe somebody will step forward. Five horrible murders happened in a span of two months. For five families, they were left heartbreaking questions for which there are no easy answers. A vicious and violent killer struck the city of Houston in the late summer of 1979, and by fall, he had mysteriously vanished. Was he arrested on unrelated charges? Did he move on to strike in another place? Or did he continue killing, only changing his method in order to avoid detection? These are just some of the questions that linger now, 41 years later. This is a difficult case to dig into. Most people have spent years trying to determine in what way the crimes are connected and whether or not all five are the result of the same killer or killers. Generally, this case is split into three different sections. Those who believe the murders of Alice and Mary were performed by the same person. Those who believe the murders of Alice, Mary, and Doris were performed by the same person and then those who believe that all five murders were committed by the same person. The most logical way to approach it is probably to begin with Alice and Mary. It seems most rational to assume that there's a connection here because of all the similarities. The two crimes occurred exactly two weeks apart on Fridays. Both women lived in the same apartment complex, though on different floors. Alice lived on the ground level, apartment number 409, while Mary lived on the third floor, apartment number 484. Sometime between the evening of Thursday, July 26th and the morning of Friday, July 27th, an unknown assailant entered Alice's apartment and attacked. We know that in both Mary and Alice's cases, there were no signs of forced entry, which implies one of several different possibilities. Either the killer was let in by the victims, had access to the apartment some other way, maybe possessing a key or gaining entry in a way that didn't leave a sign of forced entry, perhaps an open window that the killer closed afterward. Victim selection is curious. How did the killer choose Alice? If she was someone he was stalking, someone he had picked out in advance, there's a few questions I'd like to explore. Firstly, was the killer aware that on the night of the murder, Alice didn't have a car? It was in the shop and she was getting a ride to work the next day. I imagine he would have been aware since when he arrived at the apartment complex, her car wouldn't be in its usual spot. I've always wondered if Alice rode the bus home from the mechanic shop that night. Did she ever ride the bus at all? I'll get more into that later. Now, even if he was thrown off by her car not being there, maybe the killer saw the light on, or maybe he saw movement. Hell, maybe he saw Alice herself through the window. That adds an extra level of creepy to it all, that the killer may have been sitting in his car watching her for an undetermined amount of time the night he struck. Was the absence of her car a deciding factor, like if things went wrong, she'd have no way to escape? That's hard to say, but we'll come back to the transportation aspect later when we discuss Mary. And while these two cases have a lot of links, there are variations in the crimes. For instance, Alice was restrained, ankles and one wrist bound in a wire. There's no specifics on where the wire came from, so I'm assuming it belonged to something in the house, maybe an extension cord or vacuum cable. Either way, Alice gets restrained. She is sexually assaulted and strangled. Afterward, the killer decapitates her post-mortem. We know at the scene there was a double-edged razor lying not far from the butcher knife, which it's believed was used to perform the decapitation. It's bizarre to me that the killer didn't bring the weapon with him. 
he instead grabs a knife out of Alice's kitchen. If you're planning a knife attack, if you know you're going to decapitate the victim, why wouldn't you bring something that's going to make it easier? It's always seemed strange to me that the killer didn't plan for this. I mean, maybe he did. Maybe he had a gun to control the victim before he attacked to get her tied up. But still, I don't think he decided spur of the moment to perform the decapitation. That doesn't seem like something that would just come to you. Also, why do the decapitation at all? He'd already strangled her. She was dead. Why take this extra step? Why take the time? Why put yourself at further risk? I want to take a moment to address strangulation. Strangulation isn't exactly common among serial killers, but it isn't uncommon. It represents a little less than 40% of the causes of death when it comes to serial killers. It's a power thing, control dominating the victim. Strangulation can come out of rage, though. Often it does. A focused anger towards the victim. Now, we have to wonder, did the killer strangle Alice because he had anger towards her in particular? Or did he do it because he didn't want her looking at him while he killed her? There have been different links drawn between strangulation and sexual sadism, though being that only Alice was strangled, that might make her case unique compared to the rest. Those answers could provide interesting insights. Unfortunately, the details are limited, but I'd be very curious to know if the killer strangled her from behind or while facing her, if he used his hands or if he used something else. I also think it's important to note that the killer left a pillow and bedding covering the upper half of Alice's body. He concealed what he had done. Oftentimes, that's a sign of shame or remorse. Maybe that's partially why the profile said that he felt bad about it, but he wouldn't tell anybody about it. As far as we know, he didn't cover up any of the other victims. Does this lend credence to the possibility that this was something personal between he and Alice, or is it random? Alice is the only one who was bound, who was strangled, and who was covered up afterward. I'm no profiler, but I imagine this guy may have had some link to Alice in her life, but I digress. We know that the killer left with Alice's head, and judging from the trail of blood, he either carried it open and exposed, or he placed it in some kind of a bag or sack that didn't hold the blood well. Since the trail was fairly consistent, it seems odd that it would have been in anything at all. You'd expect the blood to pool for a bit before soaking through, unless we're talking about some kind of a container that had a tear in it. It's also interesting how the blood trail ended in the parking lot. This wasn't someone who parked a little bit away and snuck in. He parked right down in front of the building, and with Alice's apartment being on the ground floor, he didn't park very far from her door. There was also a large pool of blood next to the bed where police believe the killer placed her head for a period of time. What was he doing during that time? Cleaning up? Looking for something? Admiring his work? If he were cleaning up, then why grab the head leaving a blood trail behind? Seems to imply he'd be getting blood on himself again, and likely in his vehicle. It's impossible to know the answers to these questions, but it does make the situation all the more bizarre, as if it needed any help. Going back to the knife for a moment, not only did the killer take one of Alice's instead of bringing his own, he also left it behind, right near her body. Maybe since he had her head, he didn't need the knife. Maybe that was trophy enough for him. I thought it was interesting that the profile for the killer said that he likely felt sorry for what he had done and wouldn't tell anybody about it. Is it possible he left the knife behind because he was disgusted with himself? I find that hard to believe since he took her head. I'd imagine that would be more of a sign of being disgusted at yourself. That's a hell of a way to handle the aftermath of a crime you feel bad about. It just doesn't make any sense to me. The profile has said that the killer was educated and intelligent, a loner, and likely didn't achieve sexual gratification from his crimes. Maybe I'm missing something, but it's difficult for me to accept the latter part. He sexually assaulted the first two victims. Now, maybe what they were implying was that the killer never actually finished. Maybe there was an absence of semen. If that were true, it might make the profile a little more understandable. Maybe the head was taken so that he could finish up in private, as disgusting as that sounds. I know these are horrific thoughts, but it's a path we have to explore. I mean, as I mentioned in the evidence section, we know what Kemper did, so it's an avenue worth examining. Alice's case was all over the headlines. It was talked about everywhere. It was big news and everyone wanted to get in on it, and police didn't mind because they wanted the word out. 
Someone in town had to know who this sick bastard was, but it didn't work out that way. Mary Calcutta was frightened by the news of Alice's murder, and who could blame her? Another single woman living in the same apartment complex murdered in such a grisly fashion. For days, Mary stayed with friends, but in the end, she returned home. According to everything we know, Mary talked about barricading her door and told her friends she wouldn't let in anyone she didn't know. That raises a lot of interesting questions. How did the killer get in? Did Mary know him? Was it someone she thought she could trust, like someone dressed as a cop or something else official? There was no forced entry yet again, so it's curious. That's an answer we may never have, but what we do know is that Mary fought the killer from the door to the bathroom where she ultimately succumbed. She was stabbed dozens of times, according to police, and she put up a hell of a fight, yet the killer kept coming. I've often wondered about the possibility that the killer could have been in the apartment when Mary got home. We know the fight started at the door, but it's entirely possible that fight was in reverse, not with the killer coming in and attacking, but Mary walking in and being attacked. It would explain the lack of anything blocking her door that night, unless enough time had passed, two weeks, and she began to feel a little safer. Now, let's take a moment to look at the killer here. This is a very confident killer. Not only does he keep going despite the noise that must have been made with the two of them fighting, the screaming Mary must have done both during the fight and as she was being killed, but he has the audacity to attack another woman in the same building two weeks after the first attack. He doesn't seem concerned about being caught. He doesn't speed up. He doesn't just kill her and leave. He doesn't seem concerned about the increased security, that neighbors might be paying more attention, that his victim may be more prepared for him. He goes forward with the sexual assault, and he slashes her throat incredibly deep. He doesn't decapitate her, but he does extensive damage to her throat. He stabs her hard enough that the blade goes into her chest and comes out her back. He stabs her with enough force that the blade of the knife is bent, and yes, once again, it's a knife taken from her own kitchen. He once again doesn't bring it with him. He also leaves the knife behind near the body. If he came in the door and the fight began, how did he get the knife? Unless they fought into the kitchen, he grabbed the knife and then began stabbing her. It still feels strange to me. It still makes me wonder about the possibility of him being inside waiting. Mary's cause of death is listed as two stab wounds to the chest and one to the back. I don't know if the one to the back is an independent stab wound or the result of the chest stab that went through. We know she was stabbed a lot, but it was this set of stabs that ultimately took her life. If she fought as hard as they say, it makes me wonder if the sexual assault may have been post-mortem, but that's never been released to the public. I suppose the same question could be applied to Alice. Alice was his first, at least in this series. I tend to be of the belief that this killer had attacked women before. Maybe he had begun with sexual assaults, maybe in his teens, and worked his way up to murder. Either way, Alice was the one he chose to decapitate. Whether or not he intended to decapitate Mary, I can't say. Maybe he thought he'd spend enough time there. Maybe her fighting back against him ruined the thrill or he thought maybe someone had heard it. Maybe he was fighting a compulsion, which might feed into feeling sorry. Maybe he took Alice's head and it disgusted him so much he didn't want to do it again. And in the moment, he found himself having to suppress that desire. Again, it's very hard to say. Maybe there was a noise, maybe the phone rang, maybe somebody walked by outside. Something could have scared him into leaving early, or he simply did exactly what he wanted to do. How did he pick Mary? It seems unlikely that each woman is selected completely randomly. Even if Alice was random selection, he'd have to confront the challenge of going for Mary since she was in the same complex. To me, there's a few different possibilities. Either he selected Mary and looked at hitting the same place again as a challenge, or his plan had worked so well on Alice that he figured, why change the pattern? Or maybe he was stalking both women. They were similar in appearance, both dark-haired women with similar age ranges, late 20s, early 30s. I should mention, there was discussion of Mary having a boyfriend at the time of her death. There isn't a lot of information out there about that, but from what I've read, it was either new or on again, off again. It didn't seem like it was a long-standing, committed relationship. That being said, the police also mentioned having a suspect within days of her murder, though they were unable to find the evidence necessary for an arrest. 
I'd imagine they monitored this suspect afterwards, and either he wasn't connected to other crimes, or the evidence simply didn't fit. It's interesting, though, considering how Mary had fought, you'd imagine this suspect, if he was the one who committed the crime, probably would have had some scratches and bruises. In Alice's case, I address the idea that she didn't have a car the night she was attacked. I don't know if Mary had a car or not, but I know she rode the bus sometimes. I've read a few different statements from people who recalled riding the bus with her, one who lived nearby the apartment complex and worked with her. Both Mary and Alice lived alone. Alice's car was out of commission, and Mary at least rode the bus to and from work sometimes. Could it have been someone on that bus? Or could this person have been on the bus with the intentions of stalking both women? Sure, it could be a coincidence, but as we transition into Doris's case, it becomes a little more curious. Doris's murder has less information available than Mary and Alice's, but it does have enough to draw parallels. As I stated earlier, some believe Doris's murder was committed by the same person, while others think it was a different killer. Doris was last seen on Thursday the 9th and was found on Saturday the 11th, meaning that she was killed sometime between the night of the 9th and the morning of the 11th. Mary was found at 4.30 p.m. on the 10th, meaning that the killer could have struck Doris before or after Mary, but she wasn't found until a day later. There's a few possibilities here. Maybe the killer struck Doris before Mary. Maybe he struck after because Mary had fought him so hard and he didn't get out of it what he wanted. Maybe that's why there's no reports of Doris being sexually assaulted, because he had succeeded at that part with Mary, but the kill didn't fit his fantasy the way he wanted it to. Either way, Doris is found by an exterminator sometime between 7.30 and 9 a.m. on the 11th, which means if it's the same killer, he murdered both Doris and Mary within a 34-hour window. Doris, from what we know, is attacked in her townhouse, brutally stabbed and has her throat cut so deeply that, according to official reports, her head is barely attached when she's found. Doris's cause of death is officially listed as being the result of seven stab wounds to the center of her chest and one in her back which came through her chest, very similar to the way Mary was stabbed. The wound in her neck is described as massive. Police found a trail of blood which went from inside the townhouse outside to where, much like in Alice's case, it stops, again leading investigators to believe that this is where the killer was parked. While there are similarities here, there are differences. For one, as far as we know, Doris wasn't sexually assaulted. For another, the killer doesn't leave the knife at the scene. This crime takes place at Doris's townhouse at 1508 Early Lane, approximately 8 miles north of the Orchard Apartments. While the attack on Mary was brazen, striking the same building a second time, this attack changes everything. Firstly, this townhouse was built in 1977, so it was still rather new to the area in 79. The townhouse itself is on a dead-end street, so only one way in and one way out. I haven't been to the townhouse, but I have studied the floor plans, photographs taken inside, and looked at aerial and street view photos from all angles. There's a detached garage facing the street with three slots, two of which appear to be for one side and one for the other. A wooden fence begins at the back edge of the garage, goes around one side, and separates the two units in the back. There's a gate on the side with a path that wraps around to glass doors on the back half of the unit. Interesting, the fence just juts out from the building and then meets a chain link fence. There's no wooden fence along that chain link, meaning that if that fence was there in 1979, someone could easily have just hopped the chain link to end up in the backyard or just pushed open the gate. I didn't see any kind of lock on it. The townhouse is spacious. Three bedrooms, two baths with cathedral ceilings and a fireplace. While there are glass doors on the back of the building, there's also a front entryway which appears to be in a pathway that exists between the detached garage and the front face of the building, which is hidden behind the garage itself. Much like the cases of Alice and Mary, there's no forced entry here. Considering the bizarre layout of the front entry, this presents a few possibilities. The killer could have been waiting in the backyard, and maybe Doris tended to use that back entrance. He could have been waiting in the path between the garage and front entry, or he could have already been in the townhouse when Doris arrived. There are three garage doors at the townhouse, and while I have no way of knowing for sure, there's probably a good chance that Doris had a car. 
On the other hand, though, there is a bus stop within four minutes walking distance from the home, so it's possible she may have taken public transportation from time to time. Being that police described the blood trail running to where a car may have been parked, I'm led to believe this trail went to the street. If it had gone the other way, it would have gone over a fence and into someone else's yard. As I mentioned earlier, if we're looking at the same suspect, this is the first time he doesn't get the murder weapon from the victim's home, nor does he leave the weapon behind. This leads me to speculate that the killer brought the knife with him and either didn't want to be identified by it, maybe someone would remember selling it to him, or he brought the knife with him in response to what happened with Mary. She fought him hard, and if he did have to get the knife from her kitchen after that fight began, it could have been a real struggle. Maybe he learned from that mistake and began carrying his own knife. Or maybe he knew the layout of the apartments well enough to know where the kitchen would be to find the knife, but in the case of Doris, he did not know the layout of the townhouse. Due to the differences between this crime and the others, the location, the knife, the absence of sexual assault, police are unsure if they're looking at the same killer. If they are not, then there's a chance that this was some kind of a copycat killing or someone who had targeted Doris decided that they were going to make it look like a copycat to throw the suspicion off themselves. It's possible that it was a completely different killer, but it's also possible that the killer was changing up his approach and style. While oftentimes serial killers don't like to change things, if they're as intelligent as the police allege this killer was, changing your MO can absolutely help throw investigators off. Considering the debate about who the killer was here, if it's indeed the same guy, he succeeded in doing so. Then we enter what's called the quiet period. Oftentimes with psychopathic killers, after they've satisfied their urges, they go dormant for a period of time. Of course, that's assuming that this guy was a serial killer rather than a spree killer. According to the FBI, while a serial killer experiences this so-called cooling off period between kills, a spree killer doesn't and just keeps going. If all three of these crimes are connected, you've got Alice's murder followed two weeks later by the close murders of Mary and Doris. However, this period of time is what makes me believe that the next two murders, those of Robert Spangenberger and Joanne Huffman, are not related, among many other reasons. On October 3rd, Joanne Huffman and her boyfriend Robert Spangenberger went out together. From what I've gathered, Robert drove a car which was shared with the family. We know they were seen at a Pizza Hut restaurant not far from Freed Park, which actually puts them just a handful of miles from Doris's townhouse. There's some type of an altercation which takes place in the park. We assume again this to be Freed Park. That evening, a woman is heard screaming for help on the porch of a resident who lives in the Freed Park area. The woman is apparently dragged away by a man wearing a hat, according to witnesses in the home, and then gunshots are heard. Now, I've read accounts on private blogs and forums saying that Robert was shot in the park and blood was found at that location, but I can't find anything official to confirm that. We know that the next morning, Joanne's body's found face down at a different park, that being Watonga Park, several miles to the northeast of Freed Park. Police believe that when Robert was forced into the trunk of his car, whether he was alive or dead at the time, Joanne was then forced into the car and driven to Watonga Park, where she was shot and killed. Subsequently, either at the park or in a more secluded area, the killer decapitated Robert. He was left in the trunk, and the car was left at a used car lot in the 4200 block of Magnum Road. While the exact details of the crime are fairly limited, at least in terms of public disclosure, there are a few items that are known. We know that there was an altercation at a park. We know that Robert and Joanne drove into Freed Park together. Now, authorities have never asserted that any kind of sexual assault took place that night, despite noting that Freed Park was an area where in the weeks prior there had been sexual assaults. However, we do know that in Robert's car when he was found, police also discovered Joanne's underwear, shoes, and purse. Whether or not that was the result of a consensual act between Robert and Joanne or something else is unknown at this time. However, it wouldn't be out of the question to imagine that they could have been distracted when an assailant or two came upon them in the park that night, catching them off guard. It could also be completely unrelated. Again, speculation is rampant on this particular topic. All told, everything that happened in that night happened within three miles of the area between Pizza Hut, Freed Park, Magnum Road, and Watonga Park. 
There are not many similarities between the murders of Joanne and Robert and the three previous attacks. The only detail which appears to be similar is the fact that Robert was decapitated and sadly, his head has never been located. Beyond that, they're very different attacks. There's an abduction, a chase, the crimes happen outdoors and not inside a home or apartment, and Joanne is shot. Never before had this killer used a firearm. He may have brandished one to try and control his victims, but he never fired it. Beyond that, Neither of the victims fits his typical selections. Joanne was 16, Robert was 18. Mary, Alice, and Doris were between 25 and 35, and also single women. If this was the same killer, then it would be the first time he killed a male victim, and it would also be the longest gap between the killings. For the most part, investigators link Mary and Alice's murder. Some believe Doris is also linked. Few believe that Joanne and Robert are connected. Now, this crime, while absolutely horrible, may be unique in that it could have been committed by others. We don't know enough about the altercation Robert had that night to be able to determine if it could have been the inciting incident which led to their murders. We know the park was a dangerous area at the time, and murder rates in Houston were rising, which presents a large assortment of possibilities. The one detail which may link them is the decapitation. However, There are those who argue that this may have been done to create a copycat situation to distract investigators. The decapitation could have happened for a different reason. All we know for sure is that it had nothing to do with hiding the victim's identity since his ID was left on him. As a final piece of information related to this double murder, we have the alleged confession of Henry Lee Lucas who claims that he and Otis Toole were responsible. There's a million different problems with this, aside from Lucas's notorious history of taking credit for crimes he didn't commit. Beyond that, when he led investigators to the location he claimed Robert's skull would be found at, nothing was found there. Robert is not listed as an official victim for either killer, and neither is Joanne, and neither of them are listed as possible victims. Toole confessed and recanted the murder of Adam Walsh, who had been decapitated. Police initially believed this, then dismissed it, and then in 2008 closed the case saying that they believe Toole had in fact decapitated the child. If true, this would be Toole performing a decapitation just two years after the death of Robert. The terror storm of Toole and Lucas is well known, at least in terms of them uniting in 76. However, their list of victims can't be confirmed. Again, Lucas liked to take credit for everything and frequently failed to provide evidence for his claims. Interestingly, Lucas and Toole are noted as having begun their travel around the country together in October of 79, which does correspond with the deaths of Robert and Joanne. Lucas claimed that he shot and killed Joanne while Toole had dealt with Robert, but it raises a lot of questions. Lucas confessed to and was convicted of the murder of Deborah Jackson in Georgetown, Texas, on October 31, 1979, 28 days after Joanne and Robert were killed. Deborah was identified 40 years after her remains were found, and up until that time, she was known as Orange Socks. Lucas claimed to have picked her up in Oklahoma, then murdered and disposed of her in Georgetown. While Lucas was convicted, there were multiple reasons to question his confession, namely that he was in Florida working the day she was killed. However, I should note that Georgetown, Texas is 176 miles to the northwest of Houston. Ultimately, authorities don't believe either Toole or Lucas were responsible for the double murders. Are all five crimes connected? Are one, two, and three connected? Are only one and two? Or maybe two and three? Or some other combination? These are all questions we'd like to know the answers to, but simply can't find them. While I was doing research for this episode, though, I found myself examining the areas in which the crimes happened. During this, I came upon something which is interesting to me, and while it may ultimately mean nothing, it's a curious connection. Alice and Mary are murdered at the Orchard Apartments, Glenmont Drive. Doris is killed at a townhouse on Early Lane. Joanne is in the area of Freed Park. Her body is found in Watonga Park. Robert is allegedly in Freed Park and then found on Magnum Road. Orchard Apartments has a bus stop at the corner of Glenmont Drive and Renwick Drive, approximately a four-minute walk from the building. There's a bus stop at the corner of Jacklin Drive and Long Point Road, 
an eight minute and 0.4 mile walk from Doris's townhouse by way of Flowerdale Street. 7820 Long Point Road is a four minute walk or 0.2 miles to the west of the Long Point bus stop, and it's a Pizza Hut. There's a bus stop at the corner of West 43rd Street and Watonga Boulevard, a 0.1 mile or three minute walk into the park. There's a bus stop at West 43rd and Randon Road, which converges into the 4200 block of Magnum Road, a 0.5 mile or 10 minute walk. I tried my best to get bus route maps for this area from 1979. The Houston Metro, which operates all buses and rail cars, was unable to provide me with that map. I do know that the routes were changed in 1979 after Metro bought out Hutran, the previous bus line provider. I know that the routes were changed in 2004 when they overhauled the system, according to a July 1978 booklet, Metropolitan Transit Authority of Harris County, There were lines running through the neighborhoods associated with these murder sites. I don't know how much the lines have changed since then. However, the lines today all follow major roadways, I-10, I-610, and often bus routes run along these major roadways. I did find someone who believes they can provide me with these bus maps, but they haven't gotten back to me. So if they do and it confirms what I've said here, I'll let you know. If it needs to be changed, then I'll go in and make those changes. This is just something that I noticed, and it may not be important to any of the murders themselves, but there could be a possibility that the killer either rode buses in these areas or drove buses in these areas. We know the killer had a car, so I don't believe he committed the murders and then hopped on a bus. However, it is interesting to note that in the case of Joanne and Robert, his body was found a short walk from a bus stop, as was hers, and the stops were connected by the same bus route, at least by today's standards. So unless there was a second person present, or the killer parked his car somewhere nearby where he left the bodies, or he didn't mind walking for a bit, there's a chance that a bus ride was involved with this. Beyond that, if Alice, Mary, and Doris ever rode buses, depending on where they went, there's a chance they could have encountered each other on bus changes along the way. It's also interesting to note that there's a bus stop at I-10 Frontage Road near the corner of Patchester Drive and Alice worked at Beauvais Industries, a 0.5 mile or 9 minute walk to the west of that stop. It could be nothing, but it's interesting to me nonetheless. Some people have put forth what I've called the moving theory, which I find interesting. Houston was booming at the time. The population between 1970 and 1980 went from 1.2 million to 1.6 million. Some have suggested the possibility that the killer wanted to dissuade others from moving into town. It's an interesting theory, murdering nice young women and teenagers in horrifying ways might accomplish that task. A lot of people moved out of the orchard apartments afterwards, though I think it's a bit of a stretch. If the dramatic rise in homicides overall wasn't scaring people away, I doubt five vicious murders would. However, when thinking about this theory, it did strike me that since Houston was being built up, someone could have had a grudge against orchard apartments themselves or perhaps someone who bought the land or previously owned it. We know that Doris's townhouse was built just a few years before she was killed. I'd love to see records to determine if there's any land ownership, construction businesses, or any other businesses or managers who may have connections to both properties. The apartments were built in 1965. Some people believe the killer just stopped, as unlikely as that seems. Maybe he was committed to a mental health facility or went to jail for another crime and never got back to what he'd been doing. Others think he may have been killed in one way or another. The irony of this killer being a victim to one of the more than 500 homicides that year is too much to handle. Some think the killer may have been a temporary resident of the area and his crimes went with them to some other city from which there's been no connection made. Some believe he began hiding his victim's remains, and so his crimes continued in the same way, but there were no bodies to make the connections, meaning any number of disappearances in that area could be related to this killer. Unfortunately, after 41 years, there's not a lot to work with here. No DNA, no witnesses, no composite. Frankly, I'm stunned by the lack of coverage. I searched newspaper archives for days, I emailed newspapers, reached out to reporters, Despite all of that, I was only able to get my hands on around 12 articles, almost all of which were written in 79, 
and many of which had the same information, just presented in different ways. A Houston Chronicle article from 2019 presented some additional information, and Criminally Listed's creator provided some additional, but for the most part, this case hasn't received a lot of attention. I did a podcast search and only found one which touched on the case, Murder City. I don't like to listen to other podcast coverage of a case I'm working on, but I'll likely give them a listen after releasing this episode to see what they managed to dig up since they live in Houston. Hopefully, more than I could find. Five people murdered in two months. Five families destroyed in an instant. For some of the victims, their families have since passed away. For others, siblings and children still hold out for the answers, for the truth, and for justice. Somehow, a monster came to the city of Houston, wreaked havoc, and then vanished back into nothing. Did he move on somewhere else and continue killing through different methods? Did he die or commit suicide, bringing his crimes to a grinding halt while avoiding discovery? Is it possible he was arrested and convicted in an unrelated murder and somehow no connections were ever made? Or, did he continue committing crimes, following different methods while living in the area for many years to come, and maybe still living there today? Sadly, without further information, new leads, advanced DNA technology to pull information from the crime scene evidence, or someone coming forward, the Houston decapitation murders will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the Houston decapitation murders, there is some information available out there, but it's fairly limited. There's a couple of newspaper articles, some forum posts, and some blogs, but for the most part, it's the same information repeated over and over again. If you have any information about the Houston decapitation murders, you can contact the Homicide Division or Cold Case Squad of the Houston Police Department at 713 308-3600 or 713-308-3618. You can also contact Crime Stoppers at 713-222-TIPS. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, Comment in the Facebook group or email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Lately, a lot of people have been asking me about the availability of Trace Evidence merchandise. In order to view Trace Evidence merchandise, you have two options. You can go to traceevidence.threadless.com or go to the website at trace-evidence.com and click on the merch link for all purchasing options. If you're looking to support Trace Evidence and you want access to ad-free episodes and monthly bonus episodes in addition to receiving Trace Evidence stickers and merchandise, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence. Now it's time to thank Trace Evidence's amazing Patreon producers. Alicia Lorraine, Brett Eady, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Emily Smith, Emma Vachon, Jessica Chagnon, Jessica Yunt, Kevin Bonham, Lee Campbell, Megan Cotter, Michael Graves, Nick Mohar Schurz, Pamela Coburn, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Samantha Ford, Stephanie Eve, Stephen Wyland, Tara Doble, Tom Archer, and Tracy Woods. Thank you all so much for your kindness and amazing support of Trace Evidence. That's going to do it for this week's episode. Make sure to follow me on social media at TraceEvPod on Twitter, Trace Evidence Pod on Instagram, Trace Evidence Podcast on YouTube, or search Facebook for Trace Evidence Podcast. For questions, comments, case suggestions, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. All social media links, contact forms, merchandise links, and more are available on the website at trace-evidence.com. I want to thank you so much for listening, 
and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.